Our next award is the Communications Award. Please welcome Executive Director Karen Goraleski, a co-chair of the Communications Committee. So um, I, do I look like Dr. Peter Hotez? I know I don't tweet like Dr. Hotez. Um, he is the other chair of the Communications Committee and he was unable to be here tonight, so I'm filling in for him. The Communications Award is a society level award recognizing excellence in tropical medicine storytelling through the written word. As we all recognize, today there's an urgency for accurate reporting of science to non-science audiences. Communications Award entries are submitted throughout the year and judged on their ability to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation of tropical medicine research, clinical practice, and or policy. If there's ever a time for a, a need for clear communications, we're in it right now. And I think it's important that the society, a very heavy duty research organization, recognizes the importance of clear communication to non-science audiences. So before we announce this year's winning submission, we wanna give an honorary mention to the article, Turning the Tide Against Cholera, by Donald G. McNeil, Jr., which appeared in the New York Times on February 6th. So this year's winning entry for the 2017 Communications Award is, is titled, Why a Kenyan Arctic, excuse me, Why a Kenyan Island May Teach the World How to Beat AIDS. It aired on the PBS NewsHour on July 20th, 2016, through the combined efforts of William Brangham, John Cohen, Jason Kane. The story, which received some support from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, reported on a massive HIV test and treat study underway in Kenya and Uganda where migratory men in the fishing industry had been hit especially hard and researchers are trying to create creative ways to engage them to get tested for HIV. Jason Kane will accept the award on behalf of himself and his colleagues. Jason, would you please join us on stage? First of all, thank you so much for this honor. My reporting colleagues, William Brangham and John Cohen, wish they could be here with us this evening. We're incredibly grateful for the recognition and equally grateful that we've had the opportunity to do this series in the first place. Last year, when the buildup to the presidential election dominated US news coverage, the PBS NewsHour, Science Magazine, and the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting allowed the three of us to devote the better part of six months to a series on the AIDS epidemic. Amid political conventions, mass violence, and escalating global tensions, we were given the time and the resources to travel to six places around the world to listen to researchers and scientists and people living with HIV speak in plain language about their efforts to prevent and treat and care. We were trusted to share their stories with the world, and when we did, millions of people paid attention. For good reason. At a time when hope is desperately needed, these were, for the most part, stories of unexpected hope. Throughout the world, small groups of people are demonstrating that even without a cure, progress can be made quickly against the HIV epidemic. By implementing a basic formula, getting 90% of people within a population tested for HIV, getting 90% of them onto treatment, and 90% of those people to be virally suppressed, health officials may be able to break the back of the epidemic within a matter of years. We witnessed progress not only in San Francisco where this blueprint was first mapped, but in many other hard hit corners of the globe. Kenyan fishing islands, South African townships, Atlanta's suburbs, in New York City, and in a district in Rwanda that recently prevented all mother to child transmissions for the third straight year in a row. Hope is emerging. Nearly a year and a half ago today, the NewsHour's Gwen Eiffel helped to introduce these stories on our nightly broadcast. She was so proud of this aid series because she believed that stories like these, complex and undertold and driven by solid facts, are worth telling when louder voices and more shocking stories dominate the news cycle. 
We lost Gwen to endometrial cancer nearly a year ago today, but her guidance continues to inspire our work. She once gave this advice to a group of graduates. There's information to be had, facts to share, solutions to discover, but you have to look up. Thank you to the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, Science Magazine, and PBS NewsHour for providing us with the resources and platforms to do this work. But we also want to thank all of you, the scientists and researchers, activists and patients, who help us to look up and take notice. Your work and the stories you help us tell are needed now more than ever. Thank you so much. Now we move on to the Bailey K. Ashford Medal, which honors distinguished work in tropical medicine. Will Lawrence Moulton please come to the stage to present the Ashford Medal to Margaret Kosick. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be here to present uh, Dr. Kosek for this award. I first met Margaret about 15 years ago when she was staying in a little shack in Lima known as Bob Gilman's Guest House. At that time, I didn't know that just a few years after that, she'd be in the Amazon uh, rainforest maintaining a laboratory that she set up which has served as a critical site in the MAL-ED uh, study consortium, as well as supporting many other uh, cohort studies. Uh, but I should have been able to tell because she was a very serious person. Well, that alone, uh, setting up that lab was enough to deserve a major award, I'd say, in tropical medicine, but she's done a lot more in her contributions to science. This year alone, she'll have over a dozen uh, publications that she's the first or senior author on, uh, she'll be uh, telling us uh, about those uh, later on the, in, in the year in various forms, but uh, they deal with a myriad relationships between intestinal permeability, and environmental enteropathy, fecal markers, uh, infant and child growth. She's been a tremendous colleague to us as well. Uh, she's been helping us out in, with the Zimbabwean uh, SHINE trial. Uh, the trial of uh, WASH and nutrition interventions. She's been cr critical to our uh, understanding of the, how to interpret uh, lactulose mannitol tests, uh, how to characterize environmental adderopathy. Uh, as we get the lab results, uh, it'll be even more important to have her just down the hall. At uh, Johns Hopkins University, where she's uh, last year she became an associate professor uh, in our uh, Global Disease Epidemiology Control Program within our Department of International Health. She's been a key faculty member, and it's not surprising that our strongest students have gravitated to her. She takes her student mentoring role very seriously and has provided some amazing opportunities for research and publishing to her doctoral students. Well, I should have uh, put a slide up that shows the, the reverse side of the Bailey K. Ashford Medal among other things, it has a dung beetle on it. Well, she has a tenacity of a dung beetle, but that's not why I'm mentioning it. I'm mentioning it because uh, besides humans, it's the only creature known to use the Milky Way to navigate. So why am I saying that? <laughs> well, it's because in the coming decades, many of us here today will be navigating by that true star that is Margaret Kosek. I was going to start by uh, thanking the audience. It's truly an honor to get this award. Um, it's really humbling to be here in front of you, so many of you who are friends and colleagues, and some of the people that I admire most. Um, I'm here at the society that I feel at home at, uh, where people come and who are interested not only in science and discovery, but in service and in equity and dedicating themselves to things that matter. 
Paul Farmer said it best, it's a, a society of nice people. It's a meeting of nice people. I am truly honored um, to be here and, and, and share this with you. I did go with my family when I went to Peru uh, 14 years ago. And my passion about what I do and um, a lot of the energy of the work I do is uh, shared by them, a lot of the work too, by my husband Pablo, who's here in the second row, and two uh, small assistants. I was the only one crazy enough to bring small children, but I know a lot of you are crazy too. Maybe I just don't see them because of the lights. Um, I've had some of the finest mentors that I, anyone could ever hope for. Um, uh, I work with Larry down the hall who helped me write my first K grant and um, still helps me today in moments of greatest need. Um, I have worked, uh, I did a postdoc with Dick Grant, who is an amazing mentor, who after 18 years I can still pick up the phone in my lowest moment and find someone who believes in me and who uh, will share an idea or tell me I probably need to redirect my efforts. <laughs> um, I also had a lot of help from other people at UVA, including Eric Hout, who continues to help me today, and uh, Bill Petrie, who can always uh, be counted on, uh, Richard Oberhelman, uh, Bob Gilman, uh, Hugo Garcia, um, a lot of really fine people that I've had uh, the privilege of working with. So um, thank you very much, very honored. Thank you, Dr. Moulton, and congratulations, Dr. Kosick. I'm gonna remember that about dung beetles. <laughs> Our next award is the Donald Mackay Award. Since 1990, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene have joined together to award the Mackay Medal which recognizes outstanding work in tropical health, especially relating to improvements in the health of rural or urban workers in the tropics. Tonight marks our 27th year in this partnership, and I would like to acknowledge Simon Cathcart, the president of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and Tamar Ghosh, the CEO of the Royal Society. Thank you both for this collaboration and for being with us tonight. The Mackay Medal is pre presented in alternate years by the American Society and the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Will Daniel Colley please come to the stage to present the Mackay Medal to Patrick Lamy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, and thank you very much to both the Royal Society and the American Society. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Patrick J. Lammy uh, as the 2017 Donald Mackay Medalist. Uh, this is our year to give it, and uh, we're glad that Pat is one of us. Uh, he gets this medal because of his outstanding credentials in the world of neglected tropical diseases. But Pat started his career as an immunoparasitologist, sort of sorting out the immune mechanisms and, in experimental and human uh, filariasis. He studied the pathogenesis and how to alleviate the resulting morbidity. However, he's also spent many years nimbly running the gamut, or maybe the gauntlet, of the whole spectrum of global health from basic science, to field studies, to operational research, to policy, and to implementation. Now, as all of you know, research discoveries are essential, but it is when they are led, when they lead to improved policies and programmatic interventions that they improve people's lives and become valuable in public health. I think that Dr. Farmer mentioned this in his talk. Pat Lammy has uniquely used his training to move in highly active and effective memberships and leadership roles in key committees that provide direction, accountability for all of the huge NTD programs, intervention programs, 
managed by many partners and led by the WHO. These are programs that provided treatment to more than 1 billion people in 2016. And Pat was just a part of that, but he was a very important part. One of Pat's nomination letters states, what sets him apart is his determination to understand, respect, and help guide large organizations that have unique opportunities to support the spectrum of research needed to define solutions for global health problems and to affect policy changes based on data. A theme that runs throughout all of Pat's nomination letters has to do with his personal attributes. They help explain his success in global health in this broad arena. These include, and I quote, excellent diplomacy skills, not to be denied, a calm demeanor, also helpful, fairness, integrity, a willingness to listen, and an insistence on evidence-based decisions, unquote. While in other states, his inclusiveness, openness, and communication skills ensure respect from all partners and all collaborators in the complex and interconnected environment of the NTD community. These statements describe Pat very well, and they describe what it takes to get the job done when the job is turning data into policies and policies into implemented programs. So on behalf of the American Society of Tropical Medicine Hygiene and the hundreds of millions of those who have benefited from his tireless efforts across the spectrum of global health, I'm pleased to give you Dr. Patrick J. Lammy, this year's Mackay Medalist. going to be hard to uh, follow those comments, uh, Dan. Thank you so, so very, very much. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I think I can count on having uh, Dan's support for really uh, my entire professional career since I was a graduate student. Anyway, I'm, I'm uh, honored and humbled as well at uh, receiving the 2017 uh, Donald Mackay Medal. I'm actually humbled multiple times, first for the, the nomination at all, and then the letters of support from esteemed colleagues. I think it's really important also to acknowledge that equally humbling to be getting individual recognition in what I've always considered to be a, a team sport. Um, I'm very fortunate to have worked with and been mentored by many of the previous uh, awardees of the Mackay Medal, starting with the original award winner, uh, Ray Penderson, but also including uh, Eric Otteson, Alan Fennick, David Molyneux, Gary Weil, and most recently, uh, Moses Bakary. It's really an incredible honor for me to join such a distinguished list of awardees. As many people who stand up here before you uh, getting these types of acknowledgments, I do have a long list of people to thank, but starting especially with my uh, wife, uh, Maureen, and uh, family. Uh, I think the a comment that many of us would share is that they've been incredibly uh, tolerant over the years, both of the travel and uh, the work schedule, and uh, that's certainly something important to uh, bear in mind. I have a, really owe a special debt of gratitude to uh, CDC. As Dan mentioned, I started as an immunoparasitologist with a real focus on uh, lab models of experimental filariasis. CDC gave me the opportunity to pivot and to start thinking about applying those uh, skills in the, the field and to apply those to public health questions, which of course were a source of great satisfaction for me. CDC provided me with great collaborators, uh, including uh, Mark Eberhard, Harrison Spencer, Dan, of course, uh, Frank Richards, 
uh, Dave Addis, Michael Beach, uh, Jeff Priest, Dylan Moss, and most recently Kim Wan. And I'm very uh, lucky to have learned from uh, all of them. I think in closing, it's, it's such a tremendous privilege to be afforded the opportunity to work on the development of public health programs for diseases that were literally left off the map and off the radar uh, for so many years, but as Dan pointed out, are now the targets of global programs that are reaching more than a billion people a year. It's a professional opportunity for which I'm incredibly grateful. You know, we're, we're very fortunate as a scientist to be able to look forward to the day uh, when these infections are no longer the scourge of humanity, and to be able to participate in such an effort is just an incredible gift. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Colleen. Congratulations again, Patrick. Our next award is the Walter Reed Medal. The Walter Reed Medal recognizes distinguished accomplishment in the field of tropical medicine. Will Dr. Avarinda De Silva please come to the stage to present the Walter Reed Medal to Dr. Scott Halstead. Dr. De Silva is with the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in the United States. So, so when I was first asked to um, introduce Scott to this audience, my first thought was, does Scott Halstead really need an introduction to this society? Nevertheless, it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure to um, introduce Dr. S uh, Scott Halstead, who's the recipient of the Walter Reed Medal this year. I'm actually here on behalf of um, also Wai Kung Wang from the University of Hawaii, who also co-nominated Dr. Halstead for this award. About 10 years ago, um, in an interview in uh, Lancet, um, the person who was interviewing Scott asked him what his greatest fear was, and he, Scott said his greatest fear was uh, losing his sense of uh, adventure. And I really don't think that has happened. Uh, he certainly had a very adventurous life, uh, traveling all over the world, making uh, important discoveries that continue to this day um, at the age of 86. Um, I have a few slides. Um, um, are the slides going to come up? No slides. Okay, so I guess we've had a technical issue with, sli with the slides. So um, Scott was born in 1930 um, in India, and, um, and he completed his uh, bachelor's degree um, at Yale, where he majored in sociology um, in 1951, uh, followed by um, his MD in 1955 um, at Columbia. Um, soon after that, he was uh, drafted uh, drafted into the army, and he spent about eight years in the army, which included five years in Thailand. Um, and this is where he discovered his life's work and passion, um, dengue and um, related uh, arboviruses. Um, while in uh, Thailand, he also set up the Seattle um, uh, Army uh, Medical Research Lab and ended up uh, being the director of that lab. And um, after that, he came back to the U.S., uh, spent some time at Yale, uh, where he worked with Wilbur Downs and Jody Casals, uh, clearly giants in, in arbovirology. Um, and from there onwards, he went to the University of Hawaii, where he was for many years at the Department of Tropical Medicine, where he ended up being the chair of that program. And then this was followed by a period um, at the Rockefeller Foundation, where he directed uh, a lot of their health programs. And while at the Rockefeller Foundation, he, he founded um, the Children's Vaccine Initiative. And most recently, um, Scott, together with Duane Gubler, um, also initially with support from the Rockefeller Foundation, as well as uh, subsequently from the Gates Foundation, uh, they uh, set up the Pediatric Dengue Vaccine Initiative, which is now morphed into the Dengue Vaccine Initiative, which has really had a tremendous impact on bringing basic uh, research um, um, into um, implementation, development and implementation of dengue vaccines. So, so how do I summarize Scott's uh, scientific contributions um, to arbovirology? Um, as you, in this meeting over the next few days, I think maybe some of you might um, not agree with me, but I think flaviviruses probably are the, going to the second most discussed group of pathogens at this meeting 
after malaria. Well, in 1963, in Thailand, Scott was one of the first person to actually culture dengue in cell culture. This is how far back his involvement in this field goes. Then in the mid-1960s, through a series of um, careful observational and epidemiological studies of people who were experiencing severe dengue hemorrhagic fever, Scott proposed the, the, uh, the concept, the idea of the two infection theory, uh, sequential infections leading to severe dengue through antibody-enhanced disease. Um, subsequently, in the 1970s, he was the first person to use primary uh, primate cells to actually show that in vitro, uh, FC receptor-bearing cells could actually enhance the infection of uh, dengue. And the, while we, the theory of um, antibody-enhanced disease has been widely debated, I think it's, it's really um, appropriate that we are recognizing Scott this week because um, this week in science, there's a very interesting uh, paper from um, Leah Katzelnik and colleagues um, in Eva Harris's lab at Berkeley in my mind, showing some of the strongest evidence for uh, sub-neutralizing levels of uh, dengue antibodies enhancing severe uh, dengue disease. This is through a long-term study uh, that Eva Harris has conducted in Thailand. Um, so more recently, Scott's, uh, well, he's published over 300 papers. His, his work has focused mo much more on vaccines and prevention. And, and when I sort of think about S Scott's contributions, I've known Scott for now for about 15 years, what really stands out is he's, he's, at heart, Scott is a bench scientist. There's nothing that he loves more than um, looking at data and looking at neutralizing antibody titers. Um, but what's really uncanny um, about uh, Scott is his ability to really pay attention to details, understand really excellent basic research without losing focus of uh, practical solutions, either in the clinical arena, vaccines, and in, in this regard, he's really been a beacon to many of the uh, sort of you know, younger scientists who have all these fancy bells and whistles, but really lose sight of the, the, the final goal of these studies, which is to come up with, with practical and realistic solutions. Um, so I'm going to finish by just um, also recognizing Scott's um, uh, long-term contribution to this society. He actually joined this society in 1960. Um, he served as the president of this society in 1991, um, and um, he's continued to, he received the, the McKay Award a few years ago, and he's also a fellow of this society. Um, before I finish, I also want to recognize Scott's family, who's here, including his wife, Todd, who's in the audience. And finally, Scott is not done with dengue. He's going to continue keeping us on our toes. He's going to also continue to stir up healthy debate as we approach uh, the finishing line uh, towards an uh, effective dengue vaccine. So Scott, um, I invite you to come up and accept this uh, award on behalf of the society. Well, thank you very much, Aravinda and uh, Wei Kung Wong and others who have uh, supported my nomination. I have to say that uh, Aravinda and Wei Kung are both heroes to me because they've mastered the neutralization test. <laughs> for the, for the, that's, that's an in-joke in, in dengue field. Uh, th there are um, many people in the audience who probably think that I joined the Army about the same time that Walter Reed did. Uh, it's a slight exaggeration, but we did both uh, go to Cuba. He, he went in uh, 1900 in the midst of a, a, an outbreak of yellow fever. I went uh, about 80 years later in the next large outbreak uh, transmitted by Aedes aegypti, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Um, I, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that uh, I owe everything to the Army, because I was drafted out of, of uh, residency, sent to Japan. I didn't even know the Army had 
medical research programs, and spent 11 years in the Army, and I don't want to focus just on the Army because the Navy as well, both the Army and Navy have a series of overseas laboratories and have been the uh, venue for introducing many distinguished members from our society to, uh, to, to, to tropical medicine and medical science. So I'm, I'm terribly grateful to, to the U.S. Army, but I think all of us in the room owe a, a, a shout out of appreciation for, the, for the, the last two generations, the last 40 years of, of, uh, of our ex existence where governments and international agencies have really invested heavily in this field and enabled most of us have, to have these really remarkable and exciting careers. So I'm very grateful for this uh, incredible opportunity that I've had in my life. As, as Aravinda says, lots of movement. My wife and, and oldest boy are here. They've been uh, <laughs> the uh, unwitting participants in that movement. But anyhow, we've, we've had a, a great time. I've uh, enjoyed this society and always enjoy the, being here every year. So thanks again. Thank you again, Dr. De Silva, and congratulations, Dr. Halstead.